All right, internet, welcome back. So, this week we're gonna do something a little different. And I decided to do a little of uh, both reading books as well as research, and I wanted to dive into the more practical things and the real-time things that are happening today that are interesting to me. And instead of just ranting at a video, I decided to give you some entertainment, and hence the PowerPoint. Instead of me having to go through and edit a whole bunch of videos, I figured I might as well do what I know how to do. And this isn't going to be like most uh, presentations that you see at maybe BCG or Bain or McKenzie or any other corporation that's very formal with their graphs and their wording and their sourcing and things like that. This is me just having fun doing a presentation. So with that said, we're talking about the internet and space. Uh, I want to kind of give you some broad brush strokes of it and what's happening. So I'm your guide to the internet. Welcome. All right. So the first thing I want to touch on is basically what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to, this is chronologically from left to right. So I want to first start talking about um, internet on earth. So basically what is the internet set up today and the internet in the sense of the infrastructure. So what's the physical stuff that's moving these, uh, you know, flashes of light back and forth around the planet. And then I want to talk about internet in space and what's, what's happening there today. And then I want to talk a bit about what Starlink is doing and why it's potentially different and maybe potentially successful. Last, I want to touch on kind of the big picture, so the context to this. And if future Dylan is uh, patient enough and rigorous enough to actually add timestamps to this video, hopefully you'll be able to bounce around and skip to what you're interested in. So, Earth on the Internet, how does it work? So let's talk about what first, right? Or actually the how. How does it work? Now, it's very, very simple. Basically, the Internet consists of a bunch of metal boxes and cables. And these are being moved around. So inside of these cables and these boxes are pulses of light or elect um, electrons, right? And as these pulses of light are going around, there's different magnitudes of it, and that's your information. And here you can see it's a really, really super duper simple graph where it's you, your ISP, and the internet. So you're basically sending your information to an ISP that actually runs the infrastructure, and they're sending that off to probably a bunch of servers that have the information you want, and they're sending it back to you. That's basically, in its essence, how the internet works. So here's, some, uh, here's a graph actually I found where basically it shows all the different subterranean cables as well as cables throughout the countries showing where the internet flows. And these are owned by a multitude of people, but it just shows you in this image how vast and how many cords are basically immersed throughout the planet just to send our information around so we can watch Netflix. So here is a subterranean cable, an actual image one, and it might look complex, but it's really not. These are just a bunch of layers throughout this tube protecting the uh, information you're sending through, making sure it goes through efficiently um, and effectively. And you can see these little kind of frills at the end of this, and I'll see if my mouse, you can see the mouse here. These little frills are basically glass tubes, and that's where um, fiber optic cables come into play. So that's, that's what it looks like under the sea, right? And this is how it moves around, how the internet works. So now who's being served? So at this moment in time, uh, roughly 60% of the people on the planet have access to some internet. That doesn't mean they have access to high speed, always on reliable internet. That means they have access to some. So there's a significant chunk of that 60% that actually have inefficient, really slow internet, or they have unreliable internet that happens every now and then, but it's not always on. And the sad part is, is actually the most populated places with the most people have the least amount of internet. I think Africa is around 33%, and I think AP, Asia Pacific, is around 50 So that kind of shows you um, we have internet, but we're not really serving as many people as we would like to. And that kind of goes to show why Facebook, Google, Amazon, and all these big tech companies are trying to um, serve internet to everyone, and they're trying to get it out to others. So who are these uh, internet infrastructure providers? So we talked about the consumers, now we're going to talk about the people that provide the stuff. So the acronym for these people are ISPs. So this is an uh, internet service provider, and they're basically the backbone of the internet. And uh, the origins of these internet service providers actually originates from television and telephones. And the reason being is if these uh, companies have already had a bunch of cables running to these homes for television or telephones, then why not just shove in some internet in there and have that be a connection as well? So these ISPs actually had a foot up on all the other companies trying to enter the market because they already had these cables reaching these homes. So it's important to kind of keep that in your head that the, the biggest companies today are most likely companies that originated from that space. And to show you, here's a bunch of brands of ISP providers, so internet service providers, people that run the wires around the planet. And you can see that 
I've uh, done some great artistry here. I've circled AT&T, CenturyLink, and Verizon. Uh, Sprint's not here, but Sprint's is big as well. So these are the four biggest providers in the US today. And um, a lot of these individuals uh, provide both uh, internet as well as telephones, and some actually provide television as well. And so this is a really complex com convoluted diagram. And I don't want you to get uh, bogged down by some of this stuff, so I scribbled some of it out for you. And really what I want to touch on is three things. So there's Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. And these are different types of ISP providers. So Tier 1s are the biggest, and Tier 3s are the smallest. Tier 2s are in the center. And basically, Tier 1 providers, they provide the widest breadth. And I actually think I have an image here that shows this. So an, an analogy to think about this is basically, um, you have these massive kind of electrical lines that are providing electricity back and forth around different countries. So these are the big kind of wide pipes that are run by the tier ones and they're going really really far long distances and then you have these uh, smaller wires on tier twos that are providing electricity kind of throughout the city they're they're being in a kind of a secluded area so these are the tier twos they're kind of regional right and then tier three are the um, wires that are running through your neighborhood into your home on your home street so these are the tier threes that are getting more specific to your home and to your address specifically so it's a way to think of like tier ones are the biggest Tier 2s are the regions and Tier 3s are specific to your home. And what happens with these and how these uh, economical models work for these ISP providers today is they actually pay each other. So we pay the Tier 3s, so we pay the, our, our ISP providers, we pay them a, some, usually a monthly subscription for internet. And then what they do is they take a cut of that and then they pay the Tier 2s, and the Tier 2s take a cut and they pay the Tier 3s. So basically kind of a, it's, a resale, it's a reseller model, right? So in a grocery store, they don't necessarily grow all their food, they go to the farmer, and the farmer gives them food, they take that food, they put it in the grocery store, and they sell it to you. You buy it from them, they take a cut, and they pay the, they pay the producer, the farmer. Same kind of thing with internet providers, they're providing internet instead of food. So what are some of the downfalls of this? Well, um, like I said, there's a really, really high barrier to entry to get into this because it's not easy to build out an entire infrastructure of internet for you know an entire country or even a region um, and actually be successful in it because you're com combating against so many people that have so many companies that have been in this space for so long and they're so big so there's this concept called net neutrality and net neutrality is basically um, a policy that was put in place a, a while back when the internet came about and the purpose of this was to prevent basically these massive internet providers from throttling the internet and saying that this data can come through um, and this can't or they're saying that um, this data can come at a certain speed and this data is going to be slowed down or charged more. And this has been the case for a while. And over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of arguments around um, actually trying to lift net neutrality for certain reasons. And there's a lot of people pushing back on that because if you do that, then you're going to put in what I said, what I just mentioned, people are going to start throttling the internet. And I found a recent article actually where AT&T is doing this with uh, their acquisition of HBO. So HBO Max is a streaming service like Netflix or Disney Plus or Amazon Prime. And what's happening with HBO Max is what they're doing is they're actually uh, not putting a cap on the data limits for it, but they're putting caps on other streaming services. So for instance, if you're watching HBO Max shows, you don't necessarily have to concern yourself with having to pay extra or having your data being throttled because it's going to be unlimited. But if you do that with Netflix, then it might slow down or you might be charged more. And they're favoring their services over others. And that's the, kind of the whole neutrality piece that they're um, breaking. So another downfall of this is, I just have the U.S. here, but you can kind of extrapolate this to other places. So if you look at the U.S., this map basically shows a bunch of different colors, right? So if you see blue, blue is good. Thumbs up. And the reason being is blue basically states that the people in this location have access to at least one ISP provider that hasn't violated net neutrality rules. But everywhere else, basically, they have. So gray is where there is no population. But if you look at yellow, orange, and red, these are different variations of how people have access to either one or multiple ISP providers that have violated net neutrality. So it goes to show you kind of how, um, how potentially infected this uh, kind of industry can be if given too much power. So Google Fiber was one of Google's attempts to actually um, disrupt this industry and kind of insert themselves through providing their own fiber optic cables for internet. But in, two, in 2016, that actually kind of flopped. 
So they, they still have certain locations where they're running it and they're operating it, but they've, they've given up on expanding because it is so costly and it is so difficult. Um, they do have Project Loon where they're flying balloons around and trying to give internet that way, but this is just a temporary kind of fix. It's, it's the balloons I think last 200 days and they have to repair them. So it's not a long-term kind of internet providing solution. So we've talked about Earth internet. Now let's talk about internet in space and what's happening there. And here is another amazing GIF. I love my GIFs. So how does it work? Um, with the space-based internet, it's, it's pretty simple. So there's three pieces, right? So there's a satellite in space, there's a ground station, which is like a massive antenna, and then there's your antenna on your roof, right? And what's happening here is, say you're on your computer and you're searching something. So you go to Netflix and you search a show. And what happens is this, when you search, when you go to Netflix's website, it, what happens is you send that request to the satellite. The satellite then pings that request down to the ground station, which is connected to your provider. And then what they do is they run that information through actual cables into the internet. Then that goes to Netflix's servers. Netflix's server sends that back to the ground station. The ground station then sends that information back to the satellite, back to your antenna, and then back to your computer, right? So it's basically extending the reach of these cables through satellites instead of having to run cables everywhere. So that's kind of the premise of satellite internet. So there are different variations of satellite internet and the variations basically are associated to how far away from the planet the satellite is, right? So here I have Leo, Mio, and Geo, and these are different distances from the planet that people like to talk about. And the acronym stands for low earth orbit, medium earth orbit, and geostationary earth orbit. So you can ignore Mio, middle earth orbit, because not many people do stuff in there for satellites, for internet at least. Um, most people are playing in Geo, and then some people have attempted Leo. So Geo is, uh, let, me, let me explain Geo and Leo, so the difference between the two. So Geo is basically uh, stationary, so geostationary orbit. And let me, let me go back. So geostationary orbit means that the satellite is actually stationary on the planet. So if it's over North America, it's always going to be over North America. It's never going to rotate around the planet. So as the planet rotates, the satellite rotates with it. Instead, for LEO, lower Earth orbit, what's happening is it's a lot closer to the planet, so it takes up a lot less uh, space um, in vision-wise. So it's actually rotating around the planet consistently, and it's not sitting in one specific location. So here I have some bullet points so you can do a comparison between the two. Uh, so GEO uh, tend to be, tends to be quite slow. It's actually, I think it came across the fact that it was 12 times slower than uh, traditional fiber optic cables in the internet. And the reason it's so slow is because the actual, the information has to go so far. It has to go, I think it's, I think it's like 22,000 miles or something like that up into space where you have to send your information and then it has to come back to the ground station, to build, like back to the servers and then back to you. And that, that relay actually takes a long time. And that's why it's 12 times slower than fiber optic. Um, it's also quite expensive because um, there's a few providers and they're covering certain locations, but it still costs a lot of money for a consumer to actually want to use this. And the other thing is actually they exist, which is good. So that's one good thing going for Geo is Geo is an industry that exists. They're serving consumers and they've been thriving for the last couple of decades or maybe a decade or a few years. Here's some of the providers, uh, HughSat, Viasat, and Dish. Those are some of the bigger ones. But Leo on the other end, um, Leo is faster, which is good because they're closer to the planet, so the information doesn't have to go as far. But the thing is, not many Leo companies exist. And um, I just came across a few uh, brands that have actually gone bankrupt. And most, Leo, most companies that have pursued internet through Leo have actually died off through bankruptcy. I'm not sure of many that exist. There might be one or two, but not many prominent ones. And that's because it's so costly, you have to send up so many satellites um, and the upfront cost is huge. So Starlink, what in the heck is Starlink? So SpaceX, uh, back in 2015, created these, uh, this constellation, this idea of a constellation of satellites around the planet. And interesting thing about Starlink, uh, the name was inspired by a book called The Fault in Our Stars, which was written by a guy named John Green, who I really like. He's on YouTube and he actually is a co-creator of this amazing YouTube channel called Crash Course. So if you're interested in history, uh, literature, engineering, chemistry, uh, astronomy, whatever, they have this amazing entertaining like kind of series. So that's a little side note. You should totally check that out. So Starlink, what is it, right? Like I said, so they're, they're focusing on lower Earth orbit because it's faster. 
um, and because there's a lot of other benefits that come with it. And the range of distance that they're focusing on is between 215 and 375 miles from the planet. That's kind of like their, their play area, right? And how many satellites are they sending up? So they've been approved to send up 12,000 satellites by the FCC, and they've actually already shipped 480. And I think today or tomorrow they're sending up another 58 satellites. Um, so that's going to bump it up to lower 500s. And they have, they've actually requested recently for 30,000 satellites in addition to the 12,000. So they're going to have a shitload of satellites in space. And this 480 that's already up in space is important to note is that this uh, SpaceX is the company with the most satellites in space ever, period, with 480. The next closest I could find was Planet Labs at 200. So it's fast. Uh, yes, it's very, very fast. Um, and their initial goal is to get at 20 milliseconds, and I'll explain kind of comparisons for this. Their initial goal is 20 milliseconds, and they're reaching, they're trying to aim for 10. And Elon Musk slowly made a comment around how Basically, this is going to be a good enough for HD movies as well as competitive video games. And if you look at fiber optic cables today for internet, they're usually between 25 and 35 milliseconds. And like I said, Geo is nowhere in comparison to this because it's way too slow. But this does come with some concerns. So some of the concerns are really two big ones. So astronomers are kind of concerned about the amount of satellites in space that are going to be where they are and so how, how close they are to the planet. So that's going to hurt their observations of looking into the, into the universe to find the magic of the world. And the, uh, SpaceX is actually trying to solve a lot of these issues and they're working hand in hand with the astronomers to fix this issue. And what they're doing is they're, I think they're basically like painting or putting visors on the satellites to darken them so they're not reflecting the solar, uh, solar light from the sun so much. And then also there's a concern about pollution, uh, basically garbage in space because there's a lot of satellites there and that would be a lot of debris. But what they're doing here is actually past version one for the satellites. They're actually, uh, the entire satellite at past V1 is completely, um, it, it, it incinerates when it goes into the atmosphere. So after its five year life cycle, what it does is it, it kind of propels itself into the atmosphere. And then when it propels itself down, it actually disintegrates everything, 100% of it. So when is this going to happen? So North America and Canada are first. Uh, I think in two months, they're gonna do some private beta tests. And, and in five months around November, they're gonna do some public beta tests in these two regions. And then after that, they're gonna try to roll it out um, across the globe over 2021 for the rest of the world. And this would vary basically on the country and the government that is okay with them serving this to their citizens. I'm not sure if you know China or Russia will be completely satisfied with that, but we'll, we'll see how that works out because it's a country by country kind of decision. How much will it cost? So let me go back really quick. So it'll cost the consumer, I came across one number was $200 for the actual antenna on your home, which is basically the size of a medium pizza box. There was no conversation around how much it would cost on a subscription basis, um, but that's the only thing I can come across for there. But how much will it cost for SpaceX? So we have an amazing baby throwing money out of a window. Uh, and so up front, the cost is going to be about 10 billion. And that's going to be to basically have the entire satellite constellation up and running for the 12,000 satellites. But if you look at their estimations for how much they'll actually get on a per year basis, it's between 30 and 50 billion. So once it's up and running, they'll make back that upfront cost pretty quickly. So why is Starlink different? So I, as I mentioned, LEO satellites have all been bankrupt. They all failed basically. So what makes Starlink special? Why is SpaceX special? Really two reasons. Um, and there's one kind of overarching reason for those two. The overarching piece is that Elon Musk with his companies, he likes to vertically integrate. So basically anything that's important for his product, he, he makes in-house or he does in-house. So he doesn't have to outsource that to someone to rely on them to have a weakness. And basically there's two things here that he's done that are obviously going to put him ahead. So the one we all know about, which is he has reusable rockets and no one else on the planet can say that. And by having reusable rockets, you can actually lower your cost tr drastically. And also he can send up as many satellites as he wants or needs because they're his rockets, it's his company. As long as he gets approval from the government, it's all good. So the other important thing that not many people are looking at or thinking about is his manufacturing abilities. So with Tesla, the car and with the batteries within the Tesla, They've actually scaled production and manufacturing in a way that's um, mainly automated, which makes it more efficient and as well as um, reduce the cost. And 
really what's happening is they're going to take the lessons from these manufacturing and they're going to apply that to Starlink because they're already doing that for Starship. So Starship is the massive space shuttle that they're going to send to Mars. They're figuring out how to way to manufacture Starship in a rapid way so they can continually keep redu like can re re reproducing these rockets. The same thing will happen with Starlink with the satellites as well as the antennas. So they have to figure out ways to mass produce these satellites and mass produce these antennas so they can make millions of antennas for the consumers and then thousands of satellites for space. It's just taking those lessons and cross-pollinating them. One other interesting thing is the IPO. So I think a year ago, maybe a few months ago, um, the CEO of SpaceX mentioned that they're contemplating actually making Starlink and uh, a spinoff from SpaceX and IP IPOing it, making it go public. And by doing that, they're actually going to do two things. So it's going to be evaluated higher, which is a good thing for branding. But also the other important piece is capital. They're going to get a lot more money flowing into Starlink, which they can actually take that money and funnel that back into SpaceX, which the whole purpose of Starlink is to get more money into SpaceX so they can actually get to Mars. That's the whole mission of SpaceX. So getting that more money, getting more capital for R&D so they can actually get to Mars faster in a more effective way. So the bigger picture. Um, so the, the obvious bigger picture here is basically that we're giving internet to more people if we can if this can be successful. And by giving more internet to more people, they improve healthcare, education, etc. They're getting access to everyone else. And innovation increases as well. So that's kind of like the given, right? And there's four specifics I wanted to mention here that are kind of very timely because we're all kind of stuck in our homes and quarantined. Uh, so the first one is, is gaming, right? So video games. And video games has been a thing that's been happening. It's been growing rapidly over the last six to eight years, and it's continuing to do so. And the amount of people that watch and play games are supersedes almost any other type of entertainment. And it's not just that there are a lot of them, but there's a lot of people that are completely diehards and dedicated to video games. Like it's, it's, it's immersed them so much that they're willing to do almost anything to stay with it or to stick to it or find really close social bonds with inside of it. So gaming could actually be improved by this because, like you mentioned, uh, the satellites are going to be a lot faster, so the latency is low and the bandwidth is high. And that's going to help with gaming all around the world in different locations. Another thing is remote work, which we're all doing, bas we're doing basically a massive experiment right now with everybody working home from remotely. And by having improved internet around the world in different locations, there will be almost no limitations to where you can work and when you want to work, which is, which is a really good thing. And, and I can envision more companies realizing the benefit of actually going remote because you lower the cost of having to spend on the fixed costs of like the buildings, etc. But also you get more productivity from employees and they have a better quality of life. The other thing is city life, right? So I live in a city, but I uh, prefer I, not to be here and I will leave soon. Um, but there are good things that come with cities. There are, is a lot of culture, great people, um, but there's also a lot of downfalls to cities. So we primates aren't made to be around so many of each other and stacked on top of each other. Um, and the cost is super high and the quality of life is not the greatest for, you know, anxiety and stress induced things by being around so many people. And with that being said, a lot of people are going to realize from this remote working phenomenon where more companies are adopting this, they're going to start running away from these cities to places that are lower cost, higher quality of life, and more nature. So this will play a role in that because you won't have to necessarily worry about getting access to quality internet by working remotely in a place that's not necessarily in a hub where they have high fiber, um, fiber optic all the time. Last thing is IoT. So... People like to talk about and pontificate about how many different devices are going to be connected to each other and to the internet, um, which, which is relevant for kind of high density places that have a lot of uh, uh, fiber optic and a lot of really good internet there. But what happens when all the devices are dispersed throughout different countries, continents, and oceans? Because the devices aren't going to be just in one section. The devices are going to be everywhere. So if they're going to be smart and communicate to each other in the internet, then we're going to have to have internet that's widely available everywhere. So IoT is a big playing factor that could be benefited from this as well. So that's really it. I think uh, one thing I'll leave you with is a future kind of uh, pontification that if we get Starlink right on the planet and everything is accessible and, and everything is planned correctly, we get all 30,000 or 40,000 satellites up in space and people start going to Mars and we, got, we start colonizing Mars, those people are going to want to watch Netflix and they're going to want to play on the iPhone as well. And the CEO of SpaceX actually subtly mentioned this back in 2016 that once we kind of get our uh, situation settled here on Earth, we're going to have to figure out a way to have a telecommunications service back and forth between Mars and the planet, on um, planet Earth. So that, that's kind of the extension of this, is what if we get to a point where we can actually have internet on both planets, 
interplanetary internet. Um, and with that said, internet, I appreciate the time. And this is a little different, but uh, check out the newsletter. And I'll see you next week.